Hi, my name is Oriol Marshall, and today I'm going to be talking about some lessons that I developed that demonstrate exoplanet clouds and lightning in the classroom. Um, I'm a PhD student and I'm part of the Chameleon Research Network. This is an innovative training network um, that looks at exoplanets and protoplanetary disks. Exoplanets being planets outside of our solar system and protoplanetary disks being the areas in which uh, these planets form. So there are 15 PhD students in this network. 13 of them are using um, machine learning and uh, computational modeling to look at atmospheres of exoplanets and the disks they form. Um, and then there are two interdisciplinary research um, uh, projects. And so I am one of these and mine is education and astrophysics. And I'm using um, research outcomes from the other PhD students and the rest of the members of the network and to, uh, translating these into teaching materials um, for high schools. Um, so give you a little bit more context about the topics that I chose and why I selected these. Um, on the left here, you can see some of the outcomes from recent publications from the research network. Um, on the top is a, um, a simulated um, climate map of an exoplanet um, that uh, we're expected to have cloud coverage on uh, many of these exoplanets. Um, you can see how the cloud coverage changes depending on the position. And then on the bottom here is um, predicted lightning flashes occurring on an Earth-like tidally locked planet. Um, and so by comparing these to school curricula, I was looking mainly at um, curricula within Belgium, um, but these do apply uh, more broadly in Europe as well. Um, so the topics that I chose was geography, which covers things like cosmology, cloud formation, condensation and humidity, physics, looking at electrical charges, triboelectric charging and insulation and conduction, and then more generally STEM, so looking at scientific research skills, problem solving and uh, modeling physical effects. Um, the lessons I developed themselves um, use inquiry-based learning. Um, I was using a 5e model specifically that I won't go into details, but for those of you that know, this is the context um, that I was using. Um, but all you need to know for this is that inquiry-based learning is very student-led um, and it revolves around students mimicking scientists' actions and behaviours in the classroom, and it's based around hands-on learning. Um, the lessons themselves are developed in collaboration with both scientists from the research network and teachers um, in order to develop these sets of inquiry um, lesson materials that are all based around these hands-on activities. Um, I've tried out these materials in a number of schools um, in Belgium, Denmark, and uh, a few in other places in Europe. Um, and there's a paper that's in the works at the moment that's talking about uh, the whole development process. Um, so I won't go into that, but, you know, watch this space. Um, the lesson structure overall um, is based for students that are aged 15 to 18, so the last few years of high school, and the suggested timing is 100 minutes, which can be broken into two lessons if needed. Um, it starts with an introduction. Um, it's a sort of quiz style, but it's more about just introducing exoplanets and the topic to the students. Uh, we then demonstrate the experiments in the class and then work as a class to uh, identify some of the variables within the experiments. Um, that's good scientific practice and also helps to prepare them for the next step, which is the student experiments. Uh, this is where we leave the students for 25 minutes to um, experiment with the setup themselves and see what they can find. Um, because during the demonstration, we don't give them information about the science behind it. And this is their time to do sort of inductive learning and figure it out themselves. Um, after the break, we then do presentation of your findings, um, both to each other and to the student, uh, to the teacher. Um, and then we have a post-activity discussion where we bring in some more of the research and some of the sort of validation um, of the work that they've done during the lesson. Um, that's the overall structure. And the goals of this lesson is to show versatility and interdisciplinarity um, of STEM subjects, um, such as astrophysics, geography, physics, um, and to encourage engagement through hands-on and interactive learning. Um, the other goal, which is really important for these lessons for me, was that they're affordable and approachable as activities. So affordable being that all of these materials for it are relatively cheap. Um, and approachable, meaning that, uh, first of all, you can easily access them, but also that the materials are everyday items. So students aren't going to sit down and think, oh, this is too sciencey. I don't know how to interact with this. Um, instead, you see it and you say, oh, OK, I can I can play with this. I can interact with this. Um, and that helps to get students engaged into the lesson. Um, we'll jump straight into the activities themselves. The first one I'll talk about is the cloud activity. And so this uses, as I mentioned before, fairly affordable materials. Um, I'm going to play in the background here just the um, demonstration that uh, is part of the lesson plan. Um, 
And so we have a jar, hairspray, ice, water, a thermometer. Um, you can see I've taped a eye chart to the back of the jar here, and that's just so you can see a little easier the cloud forming within it, so you can see the difference in how readable the chart is at the back. Um, we're using water that's as hot as you can get it before it's steaming, so it's sort of high 80 degrees, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and during the demonstration for the students, we don't give them any other science, but, um, you know, as we're all on the same page here, I'll give you a little bit of the insight behind it. Um, is that the hot water at the bottom evaporates into the jar and then by introducing cold at the top, it lowers the temperature and therefore increases the relative humidity within the jar. You then end up with this super saturated air within the jar and then you introduce an aerosol, which is some solid particle. Here we're using hairspray and then the cloud particles condense onto that aerosol and you end up with this cloud in a jar. So during the lesson itself, students will um, play around with the different variables, the different temperatures, um, the different setups, and see what is it that's making this cloud, because we won't give them the science behind it. They have to try and work that out themselves. Um, and so far in the trials, this has been surprisingly successful, um, and the students have all had really positive feedback to getting to have this hands-on activity. Um, and a lot of them have had this sort of aha moment of, oh, okay, I get why it was happening now, which has been really satisfying. Um, and so to map this a little bit to the exoplanets, um, you can see that uh, this is a screenshot from one of the student worksheets. Um, this is suggested answers for it. Um, and so you can see that you can compare for each of the stages how this would compare to um, an atmosphere on an exoplanet. Um, I won't go into too much detail just now, just for time reasons. So the next one is the lightning experiment. I'm not going to show you a video of this because it's a little bit harder to show um, on video. But basically, the idea is that it's using a styrofoam container and wool. You rub them together to get the static electricity. You then introduce this uh, metal container on top, and then you bring in a uh, fork or some other, you know, um, implements to make the static shock between it. Um, it's often hard to see the electrical discharge in this experiment, but you can usually hear it. Um, and that's actually the analogy for um, thunder, when there's thunder and lightning. Um, so it's worked out pretty well when we've tried this in lessons so far, unless it's really humid. Um, there has been difficulties, um, but in general, we've usually been able to at least hear some of the um, lightning occurring. Um, and again, the materials for this super affordable basic materials that are every day. Um, the thing I have found with the lightning experiment is that it's a little bit harder to map it exactly to um, what's going on within exoplanets because um, instead of it being a step by step like the clouds are, it's more of a process by process. So in the first one, you're looking at triboelectric charging. So you're looking at dynamics going on within the clouds and particles rubbing together. The second step is more about charge separation, where it's about um, in exoplanets, you're using gravity and air currents to separate the two particles, the two types of charged particles. Um, and then the last step is fairly similar, where it's to do with charge being able to move within these conductive uh, materials and then building up a large potential difference where you get the electrical discharge. Um, so this has been a little bit harder getting through to students, um, but it's something that's been really fascinating to see them interact with um, and learn about during these lessons. Um, so to bring it back around exoplanets a little bit, because those are more generally the clouds and the lightning one, uh, the experiments can be used on for Earth or for exoplanets, um, but I want to talk a bit about the benefits of using exoplanets in schools. Um, and specifically in activities like this. So one of them would be that it shows diversity of STEM subjects. It shows that when you're using this activity and you're learning about, um, you know, you're modeling these clouds, firstly, that's similar to what's actually going on in research today, um, but that it's uh, a, a diversity, it shows this diversity within the field. So it's showing that, um, you know, you can have uh, something you learn in physics can be applied in astrophysics or geography or a variety of things. Um, and then the next step is that it allows for thinking beyond the context of Earth. So then you have to remove the assumptions of, oh, you know, clouds are made from water and lightning happens when, you know, uh, to the Earth. Um, and you have to think about what are the underlying scientific concepts that would apply um, universally, depending on even if you're off 40 light years away, that these physical concepts would still apply, where even if the clouds are made of rubies and sapphires and silicone, you're still going to be getting the same physical effects that are happening. Uh, and the last thing is that it exposes students to the current um, scientific landscape. So these materials were developed using current science and information from uh, researchers and that can be shown to be really helpful for students in general.
Um, I'll leave you with a link to where you can get all the resources. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing if you have any questions or if you have any um, yeah, feedback about them um, at all. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much for your attention.